So even though I try to get the recording because I these days I, I don't know how my throat is going to be. The recording had some glitches and stuff. So I just thought I will just present whatever is here. So this is a talk actually I gave uh, for um, iCoach and apparently it's available on some website called iPlanet and along with other many talks by other uh, guests. Um, so please do check it out. So the way we'll do this talk um, is like this. You will, uh, I'm going to keep pausing in between so that we can, we can take questions. Uh, and you all can ask me questions. The, um, I know one thing. So whenever people are posted in pediatric ophthalmology, especially the ones posted with me, if there's one diagnosis they're all scared of is nystagmus because they just don't know. They see this eye shaking and then they don't know what should be done, you know? So hopefully at the end of this talk, you will not be as afraid of a nystagmus patient. If you are afraid now. All right. So the learning objectives of this lecture. Oh, by the way, this is my first teacher's lounge. I'm all, I'm all excited. This is uh, since I stepped down and this teacher's lounge was started. This is my first one. So I'm very honored for, for this uh, opportunity. Um, so the learning objectives is, uh, of this talk is going to be, we're going to get comfortable with certain terminology that is used in uh, nystagmus uh, literature. Uh, we're also going to learn how to describe a nystagmus when you see one. Then we're going to see how are we going to examine a patient with nystagmus that is present from birth or early childhood. And then once we finish examining your patient, we're going to learn how to investigate such patients. Do you need to investigate everyone? If yes, who do you need? What do you need to order? Those kind of things. So, okay, not, what is not covered in this talk are approach to, is approach to acquired nystagmus. And uh, that is a separate talk. And again, I'm happy to do that as a short uh, talk another day um, for acquired nystagmus. Okay. So all of you just watch this nystagmus. Her real, really, her name is Sweetie, Angeline Sweetie. You know, she's reading the smell in. Aha, then he decided, oh, she needs to wear glasses. You can see she's doing something funny with her head. Then I have something on top of her head, right? Okay. So there are many, many terms that we use when we talk about nystagmus. And so let's get familiar with the, the most common ones. So first of all, what do you call, what, when do you call something a nystagmus? It has to be involuntary. It's a to and fro, rhythmic and repeated eye movements. So it's not bizarre eye movements. It's not anything that patients do voluntarily. So the definition is very important because there are other eye movement disorders like opsoclonus, which are not rhythmic. So if you want to broadly look at nystagmus to understand them, you can say, hey, maybe there is a sensory vision deficit or there is a congenital motor abnormality. So broadly, this is how we think of nystagmus and this is how we, we used to classify nystagmus as sensory or motor once upon a time. Um, say when I was a resident, a PG, I was a fellow. This is how we classified it as sensory and motor. Now, a study, however, looked at 91% of congenital nystagmus. They looked at congenital nystagmus and found that the vast majority actually had a sensory cause. And half of these were albinism. So the idea is if whatever nystagmus you see, especially if it's from birth to child, early childhood, you presume there is a sensory cause. You rule out a sensory cause. Okay. Right. Now we're going to move on to describing the nystagmus. 
horizontal and horizontal could again be uh, so it could be horizontal vertical or torsional and each of these can be divided into pendular which means the two phases are the same velocity jerk where there's one fast and the other is slow and so horizontal vertical rotary or torsional can all be pendular or jerk okay so one more uh, uh, terminology i'm going to introduce before we see some examples so we also need to understand what is frequency and amplitude the frequency is number of beats per second and amplitude is how large is the excursion okay now you all must have come across this term called null point and it means that the nystagmus amplitude and frequency are least at this point that is a null point so let us look at this um, nystagmus another example you can see it's kind of it has a little vertical component it's got a little rotatory component you kind of get the feeling the patient is not able to see very well I'm sure you get that feeling. She's not really following the finger. She's kind of looking blank at nothing in particular. Okay. As opposed to the previous girl, Sweetie, who was nicely reading this melon. So, few few more uh, terminologies. So we covered horizontal, vertical, rotary. We covered frequency, amplitude. Now we're going to look at manifest and latent. So, what do you mean by manifest? It means it's seen all the time. Latent means it's seen only when the fusion is disrupted. And what are the ways in which fusion can be disrupted? You can go and cover one eye, fusion will be disrupted. Or if there is a tropia, a squint, you can presume the fusion is disrupted, then there is no fusion. So these are the two conditions where you may see a latent nystagmus. Okay, so let's first cover manis manifest nystagmus. Okay. Are you all with me till now? Any questions from anyone as far as terminology? If not, then we'll move. So let's talk about manifest nystagmus. And we talked about jerk, remember? What is jerk? There is a slow and a fast phase. So Bhavini, which is the abnormal phase? Is it the slow phase or the fast phase? Fast the phase. slow phase. Exactly, the slow phase. Because the slow phase, the abnormal component which takes the fovea off the object of regard. And the fast phase is the corrective phase. It brings it back. Correct? So, but nystagmus is conventionally described by the fast phase. Even though that is not the abnormal phase. So, there, if it's as we call it right beating and left beating depending on which way is the fast phase? Okay, so let's look at an example. Is that visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. So you can see this is the left eye. And what beating is this? Divyansh? Left beating. Left beating. Left beating, very good. So you see very clearly that is a left bar beating. That's a jerk nystagmus. So foveation time basically means that the fovea is on the object of regard for a long time. So long foveation time means it is the object of the regard is uh, the fovea is on it for a long time. So better visual acuity. So all your nystagmus treatments, drops and surgery and everything is geared towards increasing the foveation time. Okay, so remember this important uh, term called foveation. So then how do we capture it? So if you want to diagrammatically look at uh, what the nystagmus looks like, it's nice to get an electro nystagmography recording. So if you see, as you can expect, there is a slow phase and a fast phase in the jerk. It's an accelerating velocity slow phase. And in pendular, the both, uh, uh, you know, the to and fro motion, the everything is equal. So now we move first. So now the manifest nystagmus is clear, I think, to everybody. Basically, you're going to see whether it's jerk or pendular. And it's something that is the nystagmus is visible at all times and you call it manifest. So now we're going to move to latent. Okay. So there is something called manifest latent nystagmus. Now it's getting a little confusing, I know, but it, 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 become, it will become clearer. 
it's a typical latent nystagmus like behavior but seen in the manifest state so let us look at one more video latent nystagmus is another form of congenital nystagmus however in forward gaze there are no oscillations when one eye is occluded binocular oscillations are seen jerk away from the eye that's occluded note here the right eye is occluded the jerks are away from the occluded eye and again away from the left eye which is occluded okay question to everybody who are anybody so what did you see uh um alekia what did you see in this video mom uh, when uh, initially there was no nystagmus mom once the one eye was covered there was a nystagmus in the Correct. uncovered and you, and you saw the fast face going opposite well. to the moment uh, occluded eye okay very good uh, anything else you saw in, in strabismic abnormality of uh, anything uh, Uh, on uncovering the left eye, it came from up uh, up to down. Ah, and what was the, what is it usually? DVD. There is, in fact, if you be, there is also isotropia. There is a small angle isotropia. Yes, so there is isotropia, and there is DVD. So, you remember we talked about how latent nystagmus, manifest latent nystagmus, can usually occur when fusion is disrupted, either by covering one eye. Uh, or presence of a tropia. So this patient actually qualifies for both. This yes, has an ED, and so there is a very small amplitude nystagmus. But moment you cover one eye, the later nystagmus-like behavior starts, where it basically means the eye is beating away from the eye that is occluded. So if you cover the left eye, the right eye is beating away from it. Right eye, if you occlude, the left eye is beating away from it. Away from the nose, you can remember if you want. That also is it. so that is what manifest latent nystagmus is all right now we will continue is it clear to everybody everybody anybody wants to see the video again i can play it otherwise it is on the net you can go and see it one more time also to understand uh, this then i'll tell you what happens how this patient will come no i have seen so patient will be sent by an adult ophthalmologist because suddenly they will do be examining the patient and the patient uh, will They, they will see a huge nystagmus happening tak 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 like this moment one eye is covered the eye starts beating other eye starts beating now the patient would have had squint surgery but this poor ophthalmologist doesn't know that this is manifest latent nystagmus for them nystagmus means something in the brain immediately this patient will poor thing will be subjected to mri this is that all you have to do is to take a good history find oh this is infantile esotropia with a dvd Ah, this is manifest latent nystagmus. Moment you cover one eye, it is beating away from the occluded eye. Nothing, no, it doesn't need any investigations. It's so clear, okay. But uh, this is how patients will be referred, and poor thing, they'll be tortured. So if we look at what does manifest latent nystagmus waveform look like, it looks like this. Look at this, like some sort of a sawtooth sort of appearance. Okay, uh, that's what it looks like. Now. all this is very good but now we are entering the uh, late latest latest terminologies so this manifest nystagmus manifest latent latent nystagmus all this is old terminology the new terminology is something completely different and i'm going to introduce you you'll sound so cool when you talk about this new terminology the new name is called fmns fusion mal development nystagmus syndrome everything is there in the name itself the nystagmus is because of some problem with fusion fusion didn't develop properly how do you know classic this patient coexisting tropia coexisting dvd both eyes open nystagmus may or may not be seen the latency is superimposed on that small manifest the fast face is towards the sorry fast face is away from the uncovered eye this is a mistake Fast phase away from the uncovered eye. So, so let us look at it again. I think it's the same video because I like to revise the videos. Once you understood the concept, let's go look at the video again. 
Let's look at it again. Latent nystagmus is another form of congenital nystagmus. However, in the small ET, there are no oscillations. Last phase away from, from the occluded eye. Binocular oscillations are seen. DVD in the left away eye. From the eye that's occluded. Cover the right no eye. See the isotropia that occluded. happened in the left eye. The jerks are away small from isotropia. the occluded eye. One more time. Cover the left eye. See that. See that. Ah, see that. Same again. Stack away from the left eye, which is occluded. DVD came down again. The eye came down. See the isotropia. And you can see that fast phase away from the occluded eye. Classic, classic latent nystagmus. Okay, it's a beautiful uh, video. So one more time. Now it is called fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. Coexisting tropia, isotropia in this case, coexisting DVD, both eyes open, very, very, very minimal nystagmus was seen. Nystagmus is a visually induced nystagmus I that can be stimulated with a piece of striped material. Latency is superimposed on the manifest and the fast phase is, um, the fast phase is away from the, so fast phase is towards the uncovered eye, correct. Fast phase is away from the covered eye, it's towards the uncovered eye. So, okay. Fine, everybody understood so far because now we are going to go to the clinic and see a patient. So now let us go to a patient. So we are going to ask certain questions. So I'll go over the questions and then we will apply to our patients whom we saw already. First question, first step is things are in history. When was the nystagmus first noticed? How is the vision of the child? How does the child do in school? Does the child watch TV or your iPad or whatever very close? Does the child hold books close? Is there a day-night difference in vision? In other words, difficulty in dim illumination or difficulty in bright illumination. Okay. Um, now, I'm just going to randomly ask questions because I don't know who's logged in because I can't see because I have a full screen here. Um, let's see. Um, is Divyaj there? Oh, Jazz was there. She was reading very, very hard. Jazz? Why, what is this difficult? Yes, ma'am. What does difficulty in dim illumination mean? What are you thinking of if that is there in history? In what diseases they can have difficulty in dim illumination? Ma'am, retinitis pigmentosa. Correct. Any rod cone problems, rod dystrophy, rod problems. Okay. So that is what about photophobia? What does photophobia tell you? What kind of retinal problem? Achromatopsia. Achromatopsia. Any form of cone dystrophy. Very good. Thank you. Next question is we are going to ask about any oscillopsia. Oscillopsia usually means this is acquired nystagmus. Also, you can ask the parent what reduces the nystagmus. Convergence is the nystagmus due, there during sleep. Have you noticed the uh, child having any strange behavior like head posture, head nodding? And how is the general health of the child? Any neurological history, developmental delay, etc. And then they, you also want to ask a little bit more about the visual behavior because a lot of qualitative questions you have to ask. How is the child when the room lights are turned off and carried outdoors to familiar faces, unfamiliar faces, to toys and objects in the environment? You're kind of trying to gauge, is the vision affected? Is the vision less along with the nystagmus? Is there any specific indication that this could be a rod or a cone problem? Okay. Next, you are going to ask about any preferential head posture. So, if the parent says, yeah, yeah, he turns his face. Like you saw in the first uh, uh, video, she was making a huge left face turn, right? What does that tell us? It tells us that the head posture is for the null point. And it tells us that there is fixation. And hence, functional vision. It's a good thing when you see head posture, it means the child has functional vision. If you see ocular digital sign where they are poking the eye, it usually means there is severe retinal, severe vision loss, usually due to a retinal disease. As an LCA, advanced ROP, you can see ocular digital sign as well. Jazz correctly told, photophobia, extreme aversion means congenital achromatopsia. But marked photophobia can be seen in other disorders. Mild can be seen like you can see in this list. And if the child is debilitated in the dark, then you should think of either a rod cone dystrophy or CSNB. 
Now, remember, we are talking of children with uh, nystagmus. So, birth history is very, very important. You want to find out if there is prematurity, low birth weight, stormy perinatal course, NICU admission, surfactant, transfusion, basically perinatal hypoxia and a sick child. A combination of obligatory and, and CVI with profound vision loss and nystagmus is very often seen in children with a stormy perinatal course. Okay. Developmental history. We want to ask about neurologically normal child, milestones, any family history. You want to find out about poor vision, nystagmus, hypopigmentation or easy sun burning. What are we thinking of? Easy sun burning, hypopigmentation. I'm albinism. Very good. Albinism. Very good. Super. Okay. We have another patient, this thing here, child here. Let's see if we can get this child's video going. What is the diagnosis, Neelam? If I tell you this child came from Vijayawada. And her I'm name albinism. Is, very good. And her name is Lakshmi. You may think it's a blonde Scandinavian child. Right? So this is... Uh, I should say oculocutaneous albinism. Because what is the other type of albinism? Neelam, what is the other type of albinism? I'm ocular only. Ocular albinism. So you must always be specific when you describe yes, it. Okay. All right. Now we are going to assess the visual function, right? So you want to have more. So head to toe, you examine the child. It took a good history. Then you examine the child head to toe. Now, you want to assess the visual function. So you want to know more qualitative assessment with a variety of toys. How is the child in the environment? Are the child scared of the other people? Everybody, jazz is posted with me. Child is looking at jazz and getting scared. It means there is good vision. Okay, it doesn't mean jazz is scary. It means the patient has good vision. So what is the response to examiner's face? How is the child's mobility? And child is, is child closing the eyes to the pen light? Child is scared when the room lights are turned off. All these things you have to observe in small kids who have nystagmus uh, because every, every this qualitative uh, vision assessment is very, very, very important. Okay. Okay. So, how do you assess vision in nystagmus? Remember, one moment you cover one eye, the nystagmus is going to increase. In all types of nystagmus, if you cover one eye, the nystagmus will increase, the vision will reduce. So, artificially reduced. So, you need to make some modifications. Okay. So, is Gaurav there? Now, again, I can't see who is there. I'm just going to just shooting in the dark. Is Ma'am, uh, it, it is a frosted uh, lens. Yeah. Correct. Kind of correct. You call it translucent occluder. Translucent. Yes, ma'am. Okay, translucent yes, occluder. And since my video is on, I can demonstrate there's something called distance occlusion, where you occlude like this. Okay. Instead of like this, you occlude like this. So there's still some peripheral cues coming. So the nystagmus doesn't increase. You can also use a um, plus 3.5 to plus 5 glasses. And now since I have Nikhil's at attention, what is that cost called? When you put the, some moderate hyperopic glass and check uh, vision, what is that called? Technique? Fogging. Fogging. Very good. That didn't sound like Nikhil. Anyway, fogging. Very good. Then... Um, you can also check both eyes open acuity and usually it is better near vision because of convergence is also better. Okay. Okay. Clinical examination. We're going to check a few more things. There's something called paradoxical pupils. Okay. What what are paradoxical pupils? Um, when the uh, light is turned off, the pupil will first uh, constrict before uh, it dies. Yes. Very good. Absolutely. And the, the where, where you see it is, is in CSNB, achromatopsia, retinal dystrophy, optic nerve disease. These are, that is a bad retinal problem can usually call, cause paradoxical pupils. Let us look at another video example. It's a beautiful, look at that. Light is on, pupil dilates, light is off, and pupil dilates. And when light is on, pupil constricts. Let's look at it again, okay? Did everybody get, get, did everybody see this? The light is on, the pupil should constrict. In, instead, it's dilating. When it's off, it's first constricting. That's a paradoxical pupil, 
okay this is also in the net you can go and look at it it's a beautiful video okay now we go back to our presentation but child will look at your light so be careful it's different in examining a child so you have to also see whether nystagmus is uh, maximum seen with so when any nystagmus is maximum seen with visual effort so when the patient is reading something at distance you no know, small optotype 636 624 618 then you can start seeing the nystagmus really well and you can start seeing the abnormal head posture also really well otherwise ask the parent to take video at home and bring and show you it can be a face turn it can be a tilt or it can be a chin up or down or even a combination okay so let's let's look at this one of my favorite videos look at this girl she's reading and once she starts reading look at that visual effort the chin is going up 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 can you imagine how miserable this child is anyway we we fixed her we operated on her and she is better so that is how severe head posture can be so in the olden days we made such a fuss about describing the nystagmus right um we used to call it this and that and you know it is uh, frequency is more here and nystagmo diagram and we used to all this all that we have we've given away given up all that so basically you know we used to say oh the amplitude and frequency is more in the up gaze then it becomes less in the right gaze then it becomes left left, left gaze basically it means nothing these are all secondary measures the primary measure is the foveation time longer the foveation better the vision now before i go any further i'm going to demonstrate to you what is the nafex expanded nystagmus acuity function also known as nafex if you are asked nafex in your viva it means you are getting ready for the gold medal okay so basically what it is i will tell you for example here's a patient and uh, if since my video is on you can see suppose if a patient is reading like this okay and the null is it with a small right face turn now what the nafex checks is so what is it, when there, there is null it means there is the visual acute uh, visual acuity is the best because the frequency amplitude is the least and this the longest foveation time is happening at the null point and so this is the best acuity the nafex measures what happens to the nystagmus 5 degrees 5 degrees 5 degrees 5 degrees like this up to 30 degrees on the side of the null point what happens to the nystagmus waveform and hence what happens to the visual acuity is what the nafex measures expanded nystagmus acuity function so some treatments help in improving the nafex score so can you imagine this is a child trying to play cricket he's trying to catch but his best visual acuity is only at that null point moment he turns his eye this way or that way to see the ball he misses the ball because this nystagmus increases so much can you imagine how miserable that is so that is what the treatments today help is to correct that uh, loss of visual acuity on either side of the null point by by improving the nafex i hope that is clear because this is such an important concept and this is what we use every time we treat a nystagmus patient today okay very good so that i hope you have understood but let's go back to a patient you no know, we we did all these things about how you'll measure vision and i look for visual problems etc etc so why we are doing all this because you cannot really distinguish between sensory cause motor cause all these causes just looking at the nystagmus so what did i tell you in the beginning presume there is a sensory cause for every nystagmus unless proven okay this is something you kind of under, say this is what i this is how it is um okay which means what we are going to look at anterior segment cataracts bilateral corneal opacity coloboma aniridia iris trans illumination defects can be seen in albinism so in every patient also think of a systemic syndrome okay and then look some more carefully at the optic nerve for hypoplasia pallor coloboma phobia for hypoplasia again bullseye maculopathy bilateral toxo scars look at the background pigment look at the R rp alterations for retinal dystrophies so basically examine the patient from head to toe front to back presuming that there is a sensory cause important to do a hyper refraction because high hyperopia can be seen in lca 
high myopia may be seen in some other retinal dystrophies and csnb okay now all these questions we learned right so we we just went through so we're going to apply these questions to this first girl we saw called angelin sweetie okay so now uh so we're going to go through sweetie's history when was the nystagmus first noticed three months of age okay how is the vision of the child parents says oh you know what sweetie wants to sit in the first row she watches tv from close holds book close all right there is does not seem to be any day night difference in vision no difficulty in dim illumination no difficulty in no photophobia no oscillopsia some reduction in nystagmus was noticed in convergence Yes, whenever she wants to observe something keenly, she takes a big face turn. There is no head nodding, and what is head nodding? We'll come to it in a second. The general health of the child is fine, absolutely fine. Now, we, now we checked her vision. You remember with all the ones that I told you, monocular, binocular, Spielman occluder, and this was her vision: six, twelve, and six in both eyes. Binocular acuity in preferred posture was a little better. color vision was normal okay so you can say this girl has some reduction in vision uh but otherwise nothing in history to suggest that she has a retinal dystrophy let's look at her we uh, look at the nystagmus itself we're going to observe the nystagmus even though we said you know we're not bothered about describing the nystagmus let's just take a look at the nystagmus you want to know whether it is symmetric means it's similar in both eyes And is it horizontal, vertical? You remember, we learnt all those terminologies for a reason. So let's use them: horizontal, vertical, torsional, jerk, pendular, uh, or others. Any funny seesaw, amplitude, frequency, uniplanar. Uniplanar means it's the same in all: up or down, or right or left. It's all the same plane. Horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. That's called uniplanar. And what happens to it with fixation and convergence? This is what we look at the nystagmus itself. And now let's look at Sweety. So Sneha, I'm going to ask you to describe Sneha, Sweetie's nystagmus. Okay. So what do you see now? Is it a jerk or pendular? I mean, it's a jerk nystagmus. And what jerk is it? Horizontal, horizontal jerk. Uh, horizontal gaze, left gaze. It's left beating, right gaze. It, uh, no, ma'am, it's left beating. Yeah, left gaze, left beating, right gaze, right beating. And tell me, is it uniplanar? Yeah, yeah. Is it horizontal? Uniplanar. Uniplanar. Horizontal, uniplanar. Very good. Very good. Now just see what else we observed in uh, Sweetie. So we're going to ask her to read something at distance, some small print. What do you see now, Sneha? Abnormal head posture, ma'am. What what posture? Towards towards, towards uh, the right side. What what what? The, the towards right? the towards the left side. Yeah, left face. Face turn. That's all. Left yeah. face turn. That's all. Any idea what is the contraption on her head? What is it called? It's okay. We're going to come to it if you don't know it. No problem. Goniometer. Goniometer. Very good. So this is Sweetie's story. It's a symmetric nystagmus, and like Sneha very nicely uh, described it. It's horizontal jerk, uniplanar. It dampened with a significant head posture. Okay. Now we don't know what to do with her. Should we evaluate her further? Should we investigate? Should I get ERG? Should I get MRI? What should I do? So when do you get ERG? When do you get MRI? So we have to decide whether we want to do anything for Sweetie. Other thing I haven't told you yet is Andrew's segment was normal, fundus was normal. Okay, everything was normal so far. Eye exam completely normal. Then so when do you do an ERG? If there is reduced vision, normal optic nerves, even if the fundus is normal, then you do an ERG because in many LCA patients, fundus can be normal. Okay. In her reduced vision, is it really reduced that much? Mm, not really that much. See, Twelve plus two is not bad. The stigmas itself can degrade the vision a bit. Plus, she is nothing. Remember, no photophobia, nothing, no day night difference, nothing. Otherwise, all fine. And examination also is fine. So, uh, maybe not an ERG. Okay. What about MRI? Should we get an MRI on her? Remember, there is no oscillopsia. Optic nerves are normal. Clear onset is there. And um, no neurological signs. It's a clear horizontal nystagmus. Nothing funny. No uh, see saw. Nothing. So you know what? We are not going to get anything on her. So this is. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, this is the same thing. Who gets neuroimaging and who gets? Uh, uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. 
So let's talk about sweet teeth. So almost almost normal vision, no day night difference in vision, normal anterior segment, normal fundus, normal optic nerve. So we call this infantile nystagmus syndrome. So people, whole of nystagmus is made very easy because in today's world, there is only two terminologies, two types of nystagmus. One is the FMNS, fusion, maldevelopment, nystagmus syndrome, manifest later nystagmus, which you already saw and you already know well. Other is the infantile nystagmus syndrome. Now you're getting confused, I'm sure. What is this sensory, madam said, some motor, then now she's calling it all INS. Everything comes under INS because regardless of sensory cause, motor cause, the waveform looks the same. You understand, if you're going to take a nystagmography or eye movement recording, regardless of the cause, the wave recording is the same appearance. So people decided, you know what, we will sort out the sensory cause and all that, but we can't keep calling it by different, different names. So they lumped everything into infantile nystagmus syndrome. Okay. But the bottom line is we are not going to get eye movement recording on everybody. We know this is fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. When we see the typical latent nystagmus like behavior, coexisting tropia, DVD, etc., etc., which you already saw. Everything else comes under INS. That's it. So easy. And if you find the vision is less and suggestive of retinal dystrophy, paradoxical pupil, something fishy going on in the retina, then you get an ERG. If something is funny going on with the optic nerve or child has other neurological signs, oscillopsia, which means acquired nystagmus, then get an MRI. So we're going to go back and look at three more slides, which clarifies this better. So infantile nystagmus, poor vision, coexisting with severe photophobia, high myopia, remember CSMB, paradoxical pupil, ocular digital sign, look for a retinal dystrophy and hence do an ERG. Okay. Now, when do you do an ERG? Often you will find the children of six months, eight months, parents will be panicking because child is doing ding ding like this, eye is going like this and child is not recognizing the parent, not, not making eye contact, the parent is in a panic. Should, should we immediately do off the ERG? No. The ERG is often subnormal in infancy. So if the ERG lab has normative values for infants, which most labs don't have, it is worth doing early. Otherwise, we usually wait till one year of age. At one year of age, if the retinal, if the ERG is normal, very, very, very unlikely that this is a retinal dystrophy. And if your center also has a handheld OCT, Go ahead and get it because you will pick uh, you'll you get you will pick up all the um, opt, uh, phobial hypoplasias. So go ahead and do the handheld OCT under EUA. You can do it if it is possible. They, so that clarifies the ERG. I hope. Okay. One last time, I'm going to go over this important slide. Who needs an ERG? Infantile nystagmus, early onset nystagmus with poor vision, with coexisting severe photophobia. Bilateral high myopia, paradoxical pupillary response, or ocular digital sign, any of these. Then look, even if the fundus looks normal, even if the fundus looks normal, get a ERG and do it after one year of age. Okay. Who needs a neuroimaging? If there's optic nerve hypoplasia, then you look for CNS anomalies. What is the optic nerve hypoplasia? What is the CNS, the CNS anomaly you look for? Anybody? The Moises syndrome, a double uh, double ring sign. Very good. Double ring sign is for optic nerve hypoplasia. But Demosius syndrome is the correct answer. What is Demosius syndrome? Corpus callosum HNS. HNS is actually abs. That can also be there, but it's actually absent septum pellucidum. Okay. Bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia with absent septum pellucidum. That is called the Mosier syndrome. We won't go into the details. There's no time for all that. Optic atrophy, if you see, then you have to rule out a congenital supracellar tumor. Uncertain diagnosis with possibility of spasmus newtans, seesaw nystagmus because it can occur in achiasmia. All these people need neuroimaging. So if you remember, we looked at that list of who needs neuro uh, MRI. Normal ERG, but poor vision, oscillopsia, 
abnormal optic nerves in terms of hypoplasia or, or atrophy not clear infantile onset funny nystagmus which means seesaw and pan neurological signs all these people need an mri okay we already talked about sweety and we know her diagnosis is infantile nystagmus syndrome so we're going to apply the same questions to the other lady i one more lady we're going to see her nystagmus also so when we applied the questions to her these were the answers her nystagmus was first noticed at 6 months of age she could not complete school she watches tv from cl close she can't read a book because she can't see the print also there's difficulty in dim illumination no photophobia no oscillopsia no, convergence doesn't do anything to the nystagmus no head posture no head nodding neurological history is normal but there is some family history of a similar problem in a child so if you look at uh, the, the rest of the things is where vision is count finger at uh, 2 meters and 3 meters refraction is plus 8 anybody remember what we talked about high hyperopia can be seen with what lcm lc okay good so any uh, retinal dystrophy lc you can see no head posture head nodding high frequency small and pretty uniplanar anterior segments normal fundus normal but let's let's look at the nystagmus first and then we look at the fundus so everybody agrees this is a lady with the nystagmus that is not uniplanar that is doing some torsional also little vertical also some horizontal also and she's vision is very poor she is kind of searching movement so it's very clear she needs a good look at the fundus and probably an erg so we looked at the fundus look at that this is optic atrophy you can see there is grayish mottling arterial attenuation there is rod cone dystrophy so what will you order next erg erg very good super erg yes now let's move on to management we are we have pretty much i think we have kind of mastered how to approach a patient with nystagmus how to check vision in a nystagmus patient how to describe the nystagmus how to distinguish between fmns and ins now we come to nystagmus you have to be uh, aware of unilateral nystagmus if it occurs only in one eye these are the important diagnoses you must keep in mind I have uh, examples for all of these, but there is no time to show uh, that many videos. Spasmus newtons, chiasmal glioma, Heman-Bilchowski phenomenon, congenital unilateral visual loss, and Heman-Bilchowski phenomenon. Um, so we're going to have the EGPGs. Look it up and message me. What is Heman-Bilchowski phenomenon? Any of you already know? You can tell me now itself. EGPG. Unilateral nystagmus with poor vision. Correct. The unilateral nystagmus that goes like a bobbing movement up and down associated with poor vision is called Heman-Bilchowski phenomenon. Super. I'm sorry. Between carpenter and somebody bursting cry, you know, fireworks here. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Uh, that's exactly right. Super. Um, okay. Now we come to why operate on a patient with nystagmus, or do you only have to operate? No, there are other ways. We'll talk about other management also in a second. Usually, you operate on a patient with nystagmus if they have anomalous head posture, like you saw in Sweety, coexisting strabismus along with nystagmus, or sometimes just because eye is continuously moving and degrading the vision, that also is a. But before you plan anything, few checklists. Ensure that this nystagmus is indeed infantile. There should be no oscillopsia. Again, I'm telling you, oscillopsia means acquired. Test vision carefully. Primary position, abnormal head posture. See whether this convergence dampens the nystagmus, which means you can do an artificial divergence surgery. We won't talk about that. Again, it's very very complicated. What is the both eye open acuity by fogging, Spielman occlusion? All this vision, vision, vision. Very carefully, you must check vision and. you also want to see what is the binocular function in the preferred head posture because remember you are operating on the muscles you shouldn't create one strabismus and ruin the uh, preferred head posture i mean ruin the binocular vision that's why we don't operate on very young kids where you do something and then you create some you know tropia you know and then patient loses binocularity that's not ideal so we usually wait till about 5 or 6 years of age to operate on this patient um okay head postures can be tilts Chin up or down, turns. 
how to measure and this is the goniometer this is something called a cervical range of motion device and this as you can see there's a dial that measures tilts as well okay questions before surgery is the ahp bad enough to need surgery or can prisms in the glasses help and are there any non surgical methods this is what we're going to ask non surgical inter interventions at contact lenses rgp or soft lens and the way it works is that they feel that the sensory irritation of the lens sitting on the eye leads to dampening of the nystagmus what about pharmacological they have tried baclofen and 5 hydroxytryptophan and congenital nystagmus not very good carbamazepine is used widely for eye movement disorders including nystagmus again you have to monitor lfts and blood parameters clonazepam sometimes for acquired nystagmus Botulinum toxin has been used also. Brinzolamide is the new kid on the block, which we've been using for four or five years now. It is uh, the same brinzolamide as glaucoma, same one. Uh, it is supposed to increase the foveation time. Okay. I have a few patients on it, and they're all. A few of them were happy, some were not happy, and uh, so the ones who were happy are continuing. What about prisms to improve abnormal head posture? You can try what is called a yoke prism. What is a yoke prism? ATPGs. What is a yoke prism? Prisms facing in the same direction, ma'am. Apexes and so on. Very good. If apexes, apexes are in the same direction, it's called a yoke prism. Very good. So you can see a small right face turn. Very, 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 very fine nystagmus. Sometimes you have to see it on silk lamp. Head is straighter with a prism, and so he got a prism. So what is the principle of surgery, and what is the timing of the surgery? you move the zone of minimum intensity towards the primary gaze position if the patient has to do this you just shift it like this so that the head becomes straight there is no optimal time and as i already told you we wait till 4 to 5 years of age to allow maturation of the binocular visual system thereby you reduce the chance of permanent hydrogenic strabismus with the risk of loss of binocularity and uh, we already talked about the ways to measure you usually measure because the surgery is graduated it's like tailoring 30% i mean 30 degrees 40 degrees 50 degrees all have different amounts of surgery that need to be done repeated measurements are needed because sometimes it can be a periodic alternating nystagmus okay so look at this uh, video it's very cute actually just watch left face turn nystagmus 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 slowly right face turn You see that? So that is a periodic alternating nystagmus. This was again left face turn. Slowly she will go to the right face turn. So this is pan. This is a congenital periodic alternating nystagmus. So what surgeries we have? We have face for the face turn. We have modified Anderson, Anderson Kestenbaum, augmented Anderson Kestenbaum. EGPG is what is modified Anderson. Ma'am, uh, medial right wrist resection in one eye and uh, lateral right wrist resection in other eye. Right? Super, exactly right. Large resections of yoke muscle. That is face turn. Uh, that is modified Anderson. Very good. Then you can have chin up posture. Chin up posture, you weaken the depressors. Chin down posture, you weaken the elevators. Nikhil, what is what will you weaken for chin chin up posture? What muscles? Inferior rectus. And. and uh, superior oblique super doctor that's exactly right then you can also have uh, multiplanar head posture and then you do accordingly there will be some reduction in duction because you are really going to do large amount of resections so there will be some reduction in duction you may in new strabismus be very 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 careful and you operate on too many muscles you can have anterior segment ischemia let's look at another example okay so this is this boy look at his head posture he is son of a colonel he came from shimla that was his ahp okay they do well actually this is post op day 1 i uh, he didn't want a video taken his eyes are all swollen as you can see but his head is straight what do you do for visual acuity remember we talked about the vision being degraded by the nystagmus so that is a visual that is a procedure called tenotomy and reattachment it is also called the deloso procedure and it is in basically improves and dampens the ins waveforms This is for INS patients who do not have an abnormal head posture. That is the important distinguishing feature between this and all the other surgeries. You don't have to have an AHP at all. 
but you can do a tenotomy and reattachment. And if you actually do waveform recording, you will find the naphex has improved. Okay. The expanded nystagmus acuity function has improved. Okay. Let's look at one case. I think this is the last patient just to see, you know, what kind of patients we get and how you can help them. This is a 26 year old unmarried male jeweler who had squinting of the right eye and shaking um, normal head posture, diminution of vision in the right eye. So the right eye squinting was inward, constant, same since childhood, not changing with glasses. Shaking of eyeball was also constant. And he was adopting a left face turn for, the pair, for, for his own history. And uh, otherwise he was okay. Visual acuity, as you can see, right eye 2 by 60 and high myopia, minus 12. And left eye was 6 nine. And you can, I'm not going to go through this. You, you got a right esotropia and you can see his mistake. Load, load. So what we are doing now is correcting his abnormal head posture. So remember we are, there are two things we have to correct here. One is the AHP and the next thing is the squint. Remember I told you one of the indications for surgery is coexisting strabismus. So we have corrected his AHP. Now we are correcting his squint. Okay. Now I will go over this one more time with you. Let me go over this one time. So what we do basically when there is coexisting strabismus and abnormal head posture. The eye that is held in adduction which means in his case when he has a left face turn it is a left eye that is held in adduction and we call that the fixing eye or i call it the driving eye that is the eye that drives the abnormal head posture so we correct that with abnormal with the, with the appropriate prism so in this case the eye is inside like this so i put basal prism i put basal 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 his head becomes straighter now whatever is residual I correct in the right eye and I correct that in the right eye either with a cover test if he has good vision but he is 2 by 60 so I correct it with the Krimsky, modified Krimsky. Okay. Now let's look at that video again for you to understand. He is slowly adopting a left face turn. I think you can see that slowly the left face turn keeps coming, going, coming, going. There. Now, now I am asking to read. I just held a prism in front of the left eye and slowly I can see that it is straightening out. Straightening, 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 straightening. Aye, that is straighter now. Now, I have to correct the residual with the squint, uh, with the correction of prism in the right eye. You can see there is still ET. Ah, now we put the prism base out in front of the right eye, as you would do for an isotropia. And then that is how we measure. Okay. Okay. So as you could see, this is what he looked like, 9 gaze photograph, he had a large right esotropia. The cause for his poor vision was a retinochoroidal coloboma, a large one in the right eye and a small one in the left eye as you can see which has spared the macula. So this is the, when performing simultaneous nystagmus and strabismus surgery, the procedure is determined by combination of moving the eccentric null by straightening the head using the preferred eye and correcting the remaining strabismus using the non-preferred eye. So, this is what he un underwent. OU recession resection under GA. This is what he underwent. And there is a small residual vertical. The head is straight. There is a small residual vertical because of uh, some inferior oblique overaction remaining here, which I probably wish we didn't address at that time because it wasn't that obvious. But uh, otherwise, there is a happy man pre op. And post op, he was a happy man. Systematic approach is essential. Pay attention to the cause of the associated decreased vision. Try non surgical methods to correct abnormal head posture and reduce nystagmus and choose surgery wisely. Um, any questions, anybody? Me? Uh, Ma'am, uh, how do we differentiate like uh, this okay. latent nystagmus and uh, the latent nystagmus? The difference would be the association of. Uh, Squint or LED only. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is how you distinguish. 
So latent manifest latent latent is strictly only on covering one eye. You will see it. A manifest latent means small nystagmus may be seen in binocular conditions, but moment you disrupt fusion, all the latent nystagmus like characteristic will come. And typically, you will see these as a like I said as a residual after the infertility has been corrected. Infertility is corrected, and then the patient one day goes for eye exam, and suddenly they notice nystagmus, and everybody gets very excited. Uh, but it's all part and parcel. Was that the question? I don't know. I didn't understand your question. Did it answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Any question? Was it a bit too much? I think it was a bit too much. But I hope I've gotten you all curious and that you will be waiting to examine your next nystagmus patient to apply everything you've learned to to describe the nystagmus and see if the vision is less and if so. Clinically examine the patient from front to back, head to toe, and say, "Hey, you know what? I know this is a sensory type of INS, and I know what I need to do. Whether I should do an ERG or just leave the patient alone, or patient has an AHP, and I know I need to do an Keston bomb, Anderson Keston bomb. I mean, no, I think I'll just give a yolk prism trial of yolk prism. I hope I have given you that comfort as to the path you must take when you see an astigmatic patient and you don't feel like." Running away. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, I will wish you all a good evening, and I hope to see you around. Thanks for attending. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, 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 ma'am.